All right. So this week we're going to do our second one on mollusks, the cephalopods. So this is the modern octopuses, remember that, and squids and even the modern nautilus, as well as the ancient ammonoids and other things like blemnites. So let's get right to it. Among the mollusks, cephalopods, to me, cephalopods, cephalopods, cephalopods are a really special group of mollusks because they have amazing brains. I mean, if you've ever hung out with uh, octopuses like Heather has, and, and I joined her, uh, it's, it's amazing. They, they are really, really intelligent creatures. Um, so what unites them? Well, so large sensory organs like eyes and the fact that that foot that we talked about last time, their foot has been modified into a series of tentacles for different kinds of grabbing. And obviously I'm being really simplistic as I am in all of these videos. I'm just trying to set the stage for you to do more learning. So let's first talk about the variability of cephalopods. So we could have the no shelled cephalopod. That's like your modern octopus. Fossil record, not great. Or you could take that essential octopus and put a shell inside of it, an internal skeleton. And that internal skeleton, for instance, like in a modern um, squid, it's called the pen. And in a um, fossil that's really common where I live in Northern California, in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous are bolemnites. Bolemnites have kind of a really thick uh, uh, calcified internal pen, if you will, internal skeleton. It often breaks when it gets to the the thin outer part of the of the of the blemnite, and so we find these like really solid carrot looking structures. Here's an example right here, and you can see that this one sort of broke right on the edge where it started to thin out and get hollow. But you can see that really solid calcareous blemnite skeleton. Here's another example. Again, broken. This is how it was found in the field. Really solid, um, solid calcite. All right. So that's the internal skeletons like the blemnite, analogous, but not the same, but analogous to the pen of a squid. But what's really fun in the fossil record are these cephalopods that built a shell around them and a chamber. And so they lived in the outer chamber here. And as that animal grew bigger and bigger and bigger it just added more and more chambers and if you just saw the shell from the outside like this modern um, nautilus pearly nautilus um, you would have no idea of the inside chambers but then you cut it in half and open it up and you see all this beautiful chambers on the inside and the nautiloids like this and the aminoids, of which they're subgroups, they all have these chambers. And in fact, as we'll learn, it's the structure of that chamber wall, which is what's really, really useful for identifying genera and species of cephalopods. Now, looking at this modern one, the way it's been cut, it's this is slightly more than half. And so you can see right in the middle in the half are these little, they look like little straws sticking out. They're hollow. And in life, those little straws would be joined together in one porous tube called a siphuncle. And in this cartoon, I've tried to draw like a cutaway of the shell so you could see the interior walls and that siphuncle going through. And we don't know, of course, for the ancient ones, but based on modern nautiloids, which are a distant cousin to be sure. So there's, there's a lot of a uh, homology kind of thing going on. But um, it looks like that that siphuncle is used for buoyancy control. So the animal can push more gas in to float, remove gas and fill in water if it wants to sink. In fact, they probably lived, as my buddy Kathleen Ritterbush has pointed out, that they done a lot of testing on this. And you could see that they probably just hung in the water column because the air would fill up the top part. The heavy body would be in the bottom, so buoyancy. Cartoons always show them swimming. They probably just kind of kind of just hung there. So the next thing is to go through the different kinds of cephalopod fossils we find. And um, one thing about it is it's good to kind of orient the fossils and know where you're looking. And so we always think about these, these coiled um, uh, cephalopods as starting like 
I would say by like their belly button. It's called the umbilicus. And the umbilicus is where it starts. And imagine if you were floating, I guess, floating this way. And so uh, when we look at the, at least the shell, the way it's oriented now, there's the bottom, the tummy, that's the ventral side. And the top is the dorsal side. So we have the umbilicus, the opening is the aperture, the ventral side and the dorsal side. Now let's make some creative shells. So the easiest thing to do is just make a long straight shell, straight shelled nautiloids. And we'll get to what nautiloid means in a second. They're uh, really common in the ordovician. And then straight cell, straight shelled aminoids, another group we'll get to in just a minute here. Um, I When I find them, I tend to think I'm probably up into the Cretaceous somewhere. But what you can do is you can take that and curl it up. So now what I've done is I've taken my ammonite and I've curled it up. Oh, but there are so many ways that you can curl an ammonite. Just imagine the different ways you can spiral. You can spiral simplistic. You could spiral where the last coil eats all the other coils. You could have it where the coils are totally separated and there's air between the coils. And even somewhere in between, there's a whole amazing spread of shapes you can do. But wait, there's more. Maybe you can add some ornamentation to them, horns, if you will. Some of the ammonites have just spectacular horns. But probably what I think is kind of the coolest and, and weirdest at all are the heteromorphic ammonites. Heteromorphic, so strange shapes. And that's a terrible drawing, so you'll have to just look at some pictures which are gonna be a lot better. <laughs> but these these shells coil all different directions. So it leads to a lot of complications about thinking how they lived, how they swam. Did they walk on the bottom? Did they just kind of float? It's, it's, a, it's a mess. So the next thing I wanna talk about, which is the final thing, is how do we differentiate the main groups of uh, cephalopods and the rock records? Well, I talked about belemnites, but what about the, the major groups? which are the nautiloids and the aminoids. And then the aminoids can be broken down into the goniotites, the ceratites, and the ammonites. And the answer is there's a plethora of outer shell shapes. You have to peel off, like I've shown in this picture up here, peel off that outer shell and look at the layers in between. Think about if you peeled the outside of a building and you were on the street looking at it, you would see the walls coming out. And those walls, are the septa, the inner chambers or the chamber walls. And it's the shapes of those septa, or more technically, where those septa intersect or those chamber walls intersect the outer wall that you can quickly tell a nautiloid from an aminoid, from a goniotite, from a ceratite, from an ammonite. So let me show you that now. All right, we'll start with nautiloids. They're the simplest ones. Again, here's a modern example of a nautilus. Their chamber walls are really, really simplistic. If you peel off the outer wall, you just see on most of them pretty simple curves, maybe a little bit of a bump. In fact, here is an example of an actual fossil nautiloid. It's broken, you can see the chambers. And if you look at the side of it, pretty simplistic lines coming down. Now, all of the aminoids have a variety of more complicated sutures, which is the line of that septa or chamber wall hitting the outside. And we define them starting at the umbilicus, the belly on the bit bottom of the ventral and going out into a series of saddles and lobes. And we'll look at that in lab on a piece of paper. But point is there's uppers, there's downers, there's saddles, there's lobes. And some of them are really complicated with lots of little in curves and very arabesque. Other ones are really simplistic. And it's that shape, that suture shape, which is what's most useful for keying out uh, the different kinds of genera and species. Therefore, when you find one, although it's really cool to find a nice, big, beautiful, you know, perfectly preserved ammonite, if you just have a, a, enough of that one little bit of a wall, that's way more useful than a complete one where you can't see the wall. Let me show you in Russell's style cartoon, the difference between the three. And so here you go. All right, so here I've done a really quick, easy sketch and we'll snap up some better images of the different kinds of sutures. And if it's starting at the umbilicus and going up towards the aperture, 
The ones that are pointing up are the S's, the saddles, and the ones that go down are the lobes. Gonia tights are the simplest, the smooth, a little bit of variations. Here's a sort of a typical, really nice looking gonia tight. The shell has been gone and you can see these beautiful saddles and lobes. This is a monster that I collected in Morocco. And here we go. My hand was on it. Look at the size of this thing. And do you see those beautiful but simplistic saddles and lobes? This is, at least to me, a giant gonia tight from the Devonian. Now you look at the serratites, I'm pointing at the screen, look at the serratites and the saddles are pretty smooth, but the lobes have lots of little saw teeth on them. So I think I can show this one here. If I turn it this way, actually, I guess I would turn it this way to match the picture. There we go. So you can see those smooth saddles going up and the toothy looking lobes going down. When we get to the ammonites though, we start getting them pretty crazy. Here's, here's a bit of a straight ammonite. Look at those, how the saddles and lobes are all made of little curves. Look at how complicated that is. So much structure to it. See, I've got one more here. Here's another straight one. This one's kind of cool because it's broken. So you could see like if you actually peeled off and looked at that chamber wall, look at how curvy and inside it is. And a lot of discussion over the years about why ammonites would have had such curvy walls. But here's something that's super cool. I've got a lot of teachers have come to me and said, my students want to like see evolution. And I go, well, everything in this room is evolution, everything. But I get it. You want to like do like a Darwin, like getting more complex through time. Ammonites are great or ammonoids, I should say, because the oldest ones are the goniotites, the middle-aged ones by goniot, how old, like going back to the Devonian or so, the serratites, they sort of come in, I think. I might be wrong. I don't have my cheat sheet here. We'll fix it, but I'm guessing around the Triassic. And then the Ammonites, they're sort of coming in in the Jurassic or so, and they go through the Cretaceous. And then all of the Ammonoids go extinct. But the bottom line, older, middle, younger. But what's even more insane is if you do some kind of a measure of the curvature and numbers of bumps of these sutures, they increase through time to the point that I can pick up an Ammonite like this on a drawer and say that thing is compared to all other ammonites that's really really curvy it's not the most curvy but it's really really curvy this is probably from the late cretaceous not the latest latest cretaceous but from the late cretaceous versus again this goniotite here you're going to be devonian or maybe carboniferous because it's pretty simplistic and an ammonite like this that's got to be in the Cretaceous. Look at how complicated that thing is. So hopefully I didn't offend my Ammonite friends out there. Sorry, I'm trying to do this as simple as possible, but we'll post extra stuff. And as always, if you do want the rich notes that go with the lab, send me an email at Russell. I'm Russell. You can find me on the web at uh, csuchico.edu. Enjoy. <laughs>